understanding that here you were studying China, right? But now, I mean, so, and, and, and it's so beautiful how I love these stories, how, you know, these stories develop and I'm hearing now about this book that you're making. And I mean, what inspired you now to do this? Uh, so the first thing was um, I got banned from, I, I, as far as I know, I'm not allowed to visit China anymore. Um, <laughs> okay. And, <laughs> Yeah. I got so, finish your sentence. I got banned from uh, China. Is that it? Well, I don't know if you get banned, but basically each time you apply for a visa, it probably <laughs> it gets denied. Uh, <laughs> and um, so I don't know if that constitutes a ban or not. But um, uh, so it was a so it was a combination of that that happened pretty soon when I was leave decided to leave the center and just. They'd also kind of like weren't going to fund it anymore. And so it was a culmination of these things. Uh, and then my wife getting this job, it was just like, hey, this is, but, but being cut out of China, now actually many people have been cut out. I was one of the earlier ones because in the last few years, China's taken a very um, radical turn in terms of uh, like being open to engagement with other points of view, let's put it. And um and so now actually quite a few people I know are not allowed, but a few years ago, I was like the only one, I'd got no support in South Africa or anything to do with this. It just kind of, I realized I was on my own. If I was in England, I probably could have functioned better, but I realized like, okay, I can't go back because a lot of my research and connect, like was going to China, meeting with scholars there, doing joint projects, being guest lecturer there, mm. bringing guests, you know, and so it really was not going to help. A secondly, what wasn't going to help? I don't understand. What wasn't going to help? Oh, what do you mean? Oh, not not being able to go to China anymore. Okay, going to seriously limit my work. Mm. And um, yeah, because you're researching uh, China, <laughs> so you need to be yeah, in China, right? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, so um, uh, like the things I was saying was no difference to what people would say in America or elsewhere. But in Africa, the Chinese government, I think, has a much stronger leverage. Uh, and um, it was easier to pick someone off like me because I was just like one guy. It wasn't like, mm. you know, in America, there's lots of departments and there's a lot deeper relations and connections mm. with governments and everything. Mm. But um, I, I'm not really sure why I wasn't allowed back in, but I'd always been critical of uh, China, but just out of pure principle, like I wasn't anti-China. I mean, I, I had so many things to kind of facilitate dialogue and, but I'd never like hold my tongue. I'm just like, no, I have my opinions. And, you know, when I'm in China, I don't expect, Express them in the same way as I might do in South Africa. Uh, mm -hmm. I, you know, I'm aware of those kind of cultural differences and how to adapt to them. But um, anyway, they basically said to me that um, uh, when I got a visa denied, they said I must go to the embassy and see them. And they said that um, some of the talks I'd given in China, they didn't like the topics. And then somehow they knew what I was teaching in my classes. And I was told that because uh, I like one of my courses was modern China, so it includes like you know Mao Zedong, the Cultural Revolution, the Great the Great Leap Forward, and the famine, and all of that stuff. They said no, you mustn't teach about that anymore. Uh, you must teach about the new China, and about Xi Jinping, and about how wonderful China is. Oh really? And I I said like there's no way I'll ever do that, like ever. Uh, if I was in China, maybe we could talk about that. Mm. but not in South Africa. It's mm. just no way. Yeah. Uh, you know, the Chinese are very big on sovereignty. And I said, like, you're kind of violating your own rule of sovereignty. You know, mm. like, doing this. Uh, anyway, so, uh, and then, um, then... So did I you get a call, uh, just on that note, did you, did you get a call from who to say, I don't want you to teach this in Stellenbosch? Or, like, who, who called I you? Was to summoned, I, was, I was summoned to the embassy in Pretoria. And um, and that's where the conversation took place. And um, so, did they fly you to Pretoria? Was, no, no, I I, I I was I was up there for something else. So I just I scheduled a meeting, and um, 
uh, they said like you can't go to China and they, like unless you agree to doing like being more friendly to us. And firstly, I felt like I wasn't particularly hostile to China. I just, but you also got to realize this was also the time that Xinjiang was kicking off, and mm. I had started having friends that were gone into the camp. So my Uyghur teacher who came to Cambridge and taught me for a month there, and then uh, I like I knew him in Xinjiang. He's he's been a, he's a professor of literature. He's vanished since 2017 or 18. So no one's seen him. He was taken away with a black hood over his head. You joking? There's actually an article in the in the New York Times about him that uh, another um, student of his wrote about him. Yeah. So it's kind of like was also. So I was like. I mean, we've read about Nazi Germany and like, how could this happen? Everyone was quiet. Da, da, da. So like, you know, I was just trained at like morally, you might, like not that I was like some mad advocate who was writing about this all the time. I was very, I, I wasn't like, I just would tell my students about what was going on. I, I, I think I mentioned it once or twice in articles that this is happening in this place called Xinjiang. You know, now it's like a big topic. You can Google yeah. it and there's, yeah. there's debates in the United Nations. But so I was like, I don't care if I get kicked out of China. Like, this is just, like, I can't live with myself if I'm like, and there, there are some China people who, to their discredit, they they go along with this nonsense, you know, because they're scared that they're not going to get access. And so. Um, well, I mean, like it, in but, Germany, but, right? It did, I'm sure it didn't make sense to a lot of people, but they went along with with Hitler's regime. Yeah, like, yeah, apartheid is a, another example. Yeah, another There's one. Yeah. Um, uh, the left-wing academics in Europe and America during Stalinism, they kept on, like, apologizing for Stalin, saying, no, actually, this is, like, it's actually glorious what's going on, and they kind of knew that there were mm. death camps and all of this. So, you know, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's something where, it, yeah, it happens a lot. Um, and anyway, so then I wrote... Uh, just by coincidence, the two publications asked me to write something about China. One was in South Africa, uh, the Mail and Guardian, and another one was a sort of international university news or something. It's like a global thing for an academic. And in both of them, I explained what happened. Uh, it wasn't the core of the article. I, I, the, the, core, like the articles were more about like to develop expertise on China in places like Africa, you're going to have to not just draw on China anymore for, for help. You need to join other parts of the world because they're increasingly bullying you into saying what they want you to say. And yeah. you can see it like in Africa, the China funds are like a lot of these Confucius institutes and things. And I mean, like they're very sterile places. You, you can't, there's no room for discussion or debate about sensitive issues. And I'm like, this, is, this isn't China. These are foreign countries. Like, Mm. you know like you should be able to talk about these things and um mm. so the, the articles were something like about that but i mentioned that i had been prevented from traveling then after that like a real then i started to see the like true nature of things um i uh yeah this is very interesting um i wrote these articles in the mail and guardian and this other and they got quite a lot of traction and um suddenly I got sent a set of emails in which the, the Chinese um, the Chinese uh, embassy had contacted NASPAS, asking NASPAS that all they said is like to deal with me. <laughs> Please deal with this Ross Anthony character. He's giving us trouble. Um, and that was it. But I felt like I kind of it like became clear to me. Nothing happened of it. I immediately sent it to the dean of my department. I said, look at like here's these email exchanges. Um, like, and he, to his credit, he said, I'll back you, whatever happened. But around about that time, my contract was coming to the end, and I was just like, fuck all, all of this. I'm just, I'm leaving. I, I, I don't, I can't handle any of this. I can't handle the lack of support. I can't handle the fact that I'm suddenly like involved in like a kind of James Bond plot where the multinational corporations and like <laughs> communist governments are after me. Uh, and